So PayPal recently opened source their key value database named JunoDB and I spent a few days going through it to understand its features and guarantees. In the series of videos, I will be going through the database and talking about the key details and design decisions they took while building this. In the process, we will understand how a production grade key value store is built. This is the fourth video of the series. And in this one, I will be talking about how JunoDB uses data redundancy to achieve six nines of availability. It will be pretty interesting deep dive onto designing highly available distributed data stores. So let's jump right into it. So becoming a better engineer is the need of the hour. And to help you all reach the next level, I have something that you will find amusing. I conduct super practical courses with a no-nonsense approach. These courses are designed to help you become a better engineer and ace your career. The courses will definitely reignite your love for engineering and spark the much needed engineering curiosity. Some of my most popular courses are on system design and database internals. Because I operate with a no fluff approach, my courses are enrolled by folks across all levels from SD1s to tech leads to staff to EMs to VP engineering of some of the most prominent companies out there. All the details about the courses like curriculum, prerequisites, testimonials, FAQs can be found on the course pages and I have linked them in the description down below. So do check them out and I cannot wait to see you all become better engineers and ace your engineering career. Now let's go back to the video. Now maintaining high availability is really essential for a payments platform like PayPal because it, because it deals with financial data, it deals with real time financial transactions. If it goes down, it could lead to a business havoc loss of revenue. You cannot have that poor user experience and whatnot because it deals with money. So JunoDB needs to withstand unforeseen outages like software bugs, hardware failures, power outages, natural calamities and all. Because failures are costly for a financial platform, like you worst that could happen is data loss. It needs to ensure that there is no data loss no matter what. Slow response time are kind of okay because of retries and all but you still have a degraded performance. You don't want that either. So a highly available system is a must for a company like PayPal. So to ensure high availability, understand this, understand this rule of thumb. To ensure high availability, you only need to ensure redundancy. Simple. If you are ensuring redundancy, you are building a highly available system. So redundancy with respect to database can be what? Storage and compute. So let's go through the architecture and see what all is redundant enough. So load balancer is implicitly redundant. It can scale up, scale down. If one node goes down within the load balancer, another one takes its place. That's what load balancer guarantees. So that's taken care of. Juno proxy in the previous video, we saw how it was stateless and equal. So there is no problem. Even if one of them goes down, there are others which are equally capable of handling the request. And then you have storage. This is where things become interesting. Is our storage redundant? Not yet, but we would make it redundant to make it highly available. So let's jump into it. What about storage? Now, the first thing to make storage redundant, like to, sorry, to make data redundant, what we do is we, or rather JunoDB, it's a very beautiful way to visualize it, FII. Like this is the first time I saw it. It's very beautiful. So what JunoDB does is, uh, it arranges logically it arranges the storage nodes in a grid in a grid this is the grid that i'm talking about and as in these are the storage these are not independent juno db clusters this is storage nodes and these are shards okay so the rows of this grid are called storage groups these are storage groups so these four storage servers are part of a storage group called SG1 and the column is a zone right now I'll talk about zones so these are part of a single zone these four are part or these three are part of single zone these three are part of zone three these three are part of zone four now what is a zone zone in terms of cloud it could be availability zone in terms of bare metal infrastructure it could be different store it could be different racks that you have in your data center Right? So think of zone like that and row is a storage group, which is a logical grouping of the storage servers. Right? Now this red and yellow will, will, will focus on this SG3, the storage group 3. 
this red and yellow these are shards that we talk about 1024 fixed number you can change it fii but these shards these are the shards that are owned by these storage servers right you may have like in this grid i have four zones and three storage group so the your data the key thing is this is where your, this is where your data redundancy part comes in your shards your red shard is replicated synchronously to all the four zones similarly your yellow shard is replicated to all the four storage servers on all four zones over there because they're part of the same storage group so these four storage servers owns these two shards having exact same copy of data exact same right okay now the keyword over here is synchronously so when the writes and the reads go to they go to a storage group on all of those storage servers part of the storage group the writes and the reads go synchronously and you get a quorum the read and the write quorum we'll talk about that in detail so now let's take a concrete example to understand how reads and writes work this is very important when you are building a distributed data store that needs to be distributed and highly available you'll find it across all distributed data stores out there so how reads and writes work write for a particular let's say write for a particular key k1 comes in what do we do first write for a particular key k1 comes in that key k1 pass through the murmur hash we compute the murmur hash in the previous one we saw that from that murmur hash we mod it by the number of shards that we have we know which shard this key belongs to the number of shards are fixed so we do directly mod of it we know which shard it belongs to from this shard we figure out which storage server group this shard belongs to right from this shard we know because we know this shard belongs to which storage group we know that now once we know which storage group it belongs to when we do the read or write of it it goes to all the nodes of those storage groups so when my juno proxy issues the write request instead of issuing the write request to one storage server it issues the write request to all four storage servers or which belong to the same storage group let's say my shard belongs to storage group three the write request will go to all four storage servers let's say abcd are my storage servers it goes to all four of them actually it will be an odd number I'm just using four because of lack of space over here, but in reality it is it is five actually for a PayPal production system. So it will go to all five of them, and your Juno proxy will wait for acknowledgement from maximum of them. Let's say three of them, right? So it's waiting for right quorum to happen. So when it gets acknowledgement from majority of the nodes, then it acknowledges the right back to the client that hey, right is successful. Similarly, when the read happens, the read comes from Juno proxy. Juno proxy knows that hey, this storage group is what will be owning this. The reads will go to all of them. And now what would happen? It would wait for the response from majority of them. Once it receives the response from majority of them, it would pick the latest value out of that and respond back to the client. This is how it would ensure that it is always return. It is always storing data in a redundant fashion across them. And even if a node goes down, there is no data loss because other nodes are capable of handling it. In case of reads, because it is waiting for the response from the majority, it ensures that it would always return the value which is latest one because there would be an overlap between your write majority and your read majority if you are going more than 50%, which means if I have five zones, which means on five storage servers, if I'm writing the data, if I wait for writing on at least three of them, and if I'm waiting and if I'm waiting to read from at least three of them, there will be at least one server on which I will have the latest copy of data, which is read for my read and write would ensure that it is distributed among them. Right. So this ensures we handle failovers. This is beautiful. This is such an elegant way to visualize it. This grid is such an elegant way to visualize your redundancy part that this is how your data is making redundant across multiple storage servers and how you are guaranteeing your read, read quorum and write quorum. Such a beautiful implementation, right? such a beautiful visualization of it. Right? But you would think, my God, you are writing to five instances in one shot, won't it be slow? See, 
if availability is important you have to do it right there is no way out because now what would happen is even if one of the node goes down you still have other nodes to serve the data and with still that same high level of consistency read your own writes and everything all the guarantees over there you have to do it if you want high availability because if you're writing at just one place what if that node goes down then your writes are lost right you cannot have that you paypal cannot afford that right so that's why you have to do it and now the best part of this the best part of this is you can or rather paypal can actually take down an entire zone for regular maintenance purposes without hampering the system at all because the storage node operating system needs to be updated deployment needs to happen routine health checks of infrastructure needs to happen and whatnot it can seamlessly do that without hampering any live production traffic such a beautiful such a beautiful implementation of it right okay this was intra cluster uh, intra cluster replication now let's talk about cross data center replication now because it's a payments platform what if an entire data center is chopped off what if there is a natural calamity in a data in the region where the data center is located paypal cannot say we are down because of an issue right because you cannot have data losses and all so what paypal does is it synchronizes or it asynchronously replicates the operations and the data across a similar cluster present in different data center of the same region so for example if they have data center in singapore they would have two data centers in singapore so across data center they asynchronously replicate the data and the operation who does that the juno proxy does that so let's say i have in data center one cluster one in data center two cluster two your clients are talking to data center one because why not assume that they are doing it they have your juno proxies you have your storage servers you have your load balancer over here right regular flow happens reads and writes happens intra cluster redundancy intra cluster quorums and all are maintained over here right but now when your write is acknowledged by multiple of them juno proxy knows that the write is successful it asynchronously replicates it through over the network to another data center's juno proxy so now what happens is there is an asynchronous replication setup between these two juno proxies this way your writes are eventually sent to another juno proxy instance in another data center so if one data center goes down due to any reason you have another data center to serve your data from this is how critical availability is for payments platform like paypal synchronous replication asynchronous replication we saw both of them synchronous replication with read quorums write quorums importance of it grid based layout for a very beautiful visualization of it now you can see high availability of your storage layer how to do that you can see multiple data stores doing the exact same thing this control c control v concept remains the same read quorum availability and all of that right but now you see how you build a very highly available distributed data store fascinating fascinating so yeah this is what i wanted to cover in this one this was the fourth video in this series i hope you found it interesting hope you found it amusing that's it for this one i'll see you in the next one thanks a ton